Hello ANCAPS! There's a problem I have been struggling with, and I was hoping that you could help me out. Oh hi, I'm the heretic, and I'd be happy to help. By the title of your video, I already know what this is about. Just try to make sure you characterize us correctly, instead of defaulting to well-poisoning slander attacks. If there's anything I'm sick and tired of, it's being mischaracterized. Sound good? This isn't for the old-school libertarians. This is for the serious, all-government services are better in the hands of private industry ANCAPs. The ones who just really want everything that the government does and provides to the people to be handled by private corporations. I, I knew it was too much to ask for. But I suspect this won't be the first gross mischaracterization of our ideas. There are dozens of things I never want anyone let alone a corporation to be engaged in. For example, funding abortion, or war being excellent examples. My question is this. How do you provide an expensive service to an area where there is a huge demand for it, but no ability to pay for that service being rendered? That isn't possible. People will always have self-ownership. So even hunter-gatherer societies will have goods and services that can be exchanged. So, yeah, there's a way to pay for it. I, I know I'm being literal. I know he's trying to make a point about the poor not being able to pay for private security. But you end up answering your own question. Some people would argue that on the most technical and academic level, this does not even constitute demand. Because if you need something but you can't pay for it, there is, in market terms, not any demand for it. That's exactly correct. It's called the subjectivity of value. A person who needs a heart transplant might put a mortgage on their house and borrow money from family just to be able to afford it, as opposed to, say, using that same amount of money to buy a gold bar. The owner of an industrial computer hardware manufacturer would value the gold more for its utility as an electrical conductor. His heart is healthy, so the idea of spending that same amount of money for a heart transplant is ludicrous. You can't expect people to give you their stuff for free. If they don't value the stuff enough to go out of their way to get the resources necessary to trade for it, they're communicating their preference through their actions. In the case of the hardware manufacturer, he values his time and money more than the effort it takes to accumulate funds to pay for a heart transplant. Even so, cost is not static. Who says things that are unaffordable now can't become affordable sometime in the future? In the example of private police, I actually can't imagine getting some guys to patrol down the streets for a few hours every day is the most costly thing in the world. It is an indisputable, verified fact that poverty and crime are inextricably linked. No, it's not undeniable. That allegation has never been proven, and there's even evidence to suggest that crime causes poverty. Which makes sense when you realize that if you're an entrepreneur, you wouldn't open up shop where you'll probably be robbed. Which means less local jobs. This is essentially what the police does right now. They may not stand watch in front of every single house, but the power of their investigative body and the authority of punishments through the legal system does make it so stealing from people is highly discouraged. As established by Castle Rock v. Gonzalez, the government does not have an obligation to protect you. Those investigators can only help you after the fact and the best the police will do is draw your outline on chalk. Now, does the police have a chilling effect on criminality? Well, there's precious little evidence that suggests the threat of prison and even the death penalty are effective deterrents. Not because would-be criminals are irrational, far from it. But if, say, a burglar was doing a risk analysis of robbing a home, they'd have to know the law pretty thoroughly. The difference between certain laws, like grand larceny or breaking and entering, the mandatory minimums, sentencing requirements, and trends, which can sometimes be pretty arbitrary, there's too many factors to make a rational judgment, and if you are an expert on these enough to make these choices rationally, chances are you're a lawyer. There are some crime mitigation strategies too. Simply locking your doors, including car door, 
reduces your risk of theft, and burglars won't break in if they think somebody's home. Also, carry a gun. Thing is, the people most affected by the criminality of poor people are other poor people. This is also verifiably true. Thus, in order to keep the meager property that they have, they can never leave their house and thus can never have a job. Then this must apply to criminals as well. They must stay home if they want to protect their assets. Therefore, they won't commit the crime in the first place. Burglars aren't going to steal if they have no expectation of keeping their stolen goods. It's a simple observation of economic facts that affluence and poverty will often be regional phenomena, meaning that real estate prices will be high in areas where there are few poor people, and poor people will go to areas where the real estate prices are low. You gotta love how he just throws out talking points, but prefixes it with, oh, this is an undeniable factual fact of factual undeniableness. Ugh. Thus, areas with low real estate prices have a significant correlation with increased crime. In a world where there is no publicly funded police service to at least provide a minimum amount of security, this effect would definitely be exacerbated. Not necessarily. The price of security isn't fixed. And there are more poor people than rich people. The entrepreneur who figures out how to provide quality, affordable security services will make a killing. To say nothing of the fact that when people aren't paying taxes anymore under voluntarism, their disposable income will double. Who are you to say what they could or could not afford? You could primarily concentrate on securing the borders of that neighborhood to make sure that no bad actors get in. Fighting the crime that does happen within your neighborhood would be a lot cheaper and also a lot more violent because affluent people are just less prone to violence. Well, white collar crime exists. Also, Islamic radicalization finds strong support in the middle class of much of the Islamic world. Osama bin Laden came from one of the wealthiest and most powerful families in the region. And if you want to talk about violence from middle class and rich people, you need not look any further than the priesthood of statism who are engaged in robbery, trespassing, and murdering every single day through their hired hitmen in the military and government police. Actually, this brings up another important question. What is crime? Breaking the law, right? Well, which law? Can criminals break the laws of physics? Unfortunately, they can't. So let's be more specific. Crime is when you violate government legislation. Given that the status priesthood can create any legislation they want at a whim, with no limits, the distinction between law-abiding people and criminals is completely up to the arbitrary whims of the state. We need a better definition of crime. Let's say... Criminals are people who steal, kill, trespass, and otherwise violate people's self-ownership. Backhanded reference to government activity aside, we can all agree that theft and murder are criminal. I hope. Because they're not that desperate. This would distribute costs over more individual households, while at the same time not growing them proportionally with area covered. Meaning that you can have each individual customer of yours pay less for the services that you provide. Then why on earth would you let the government do it? They don't care how much it costs, since they're a third party payer. They're just going to make it more expensive. You would have to protect each of the houses individually. People can already do that. Home security systems are available, which notify government police if there's something like a break-in. ADT brings home security and Simply Safe, to name a few off the top of my head. The market, even our quasi-fascist corporatist market, has already innovated the need to have a cop protecting every house individually at all times out of existence. And that's the thing, there may not be a lot of need for policing affluent areas, because crime just doesn't happen there. Right, because fundamentally, neither you nor I can make these calculations for them. Maybe there's a lot of crime in affluent neighborhoods with burglars trying to steal valuables. Or maybe you live in Appalachia, one of the poorest regions in America, but with an exceptionally low crime rate. And their needs could change at any time as crime rates fluctuate. Poor areas need constant hands-on policing. 
this is essential. So far, you haven't proven that. Because otherwise they will be caught in an eternal downward spiral and never be able to increase their power as economic agents. But unlike the affluent areas, the poor people do not have the money to pay for policing. They already do not pay for policing. Most people in these poor areas do not earn enough to pay taxes, even if they are employed full time, sometimes even with multiple jobs. And the few of them who do pay taxes, the amount that they pay is so small that it may just be discounted. I don't know how it is in your home country, but in the US, that's correct. At least in terms of income tax. If your income is over a certain threshold, the government doesn't attempt to lay claim to your money. But the poor still pay taxes. State and local governments have sales tax, property tax. Many states even have their own income tax, in addition to other ways they can nickel and dime you. Gas taxes, car taxes, you name it. You know where government police do not get their funding from? Federal income taxes. If your argument right now is, why should honest citizens that work hard and make a lot of money have to pay for the law enforcement of people who do not themselves contribute anything to the pot out of which that law enforcement is paid, then that same logic should also apply to private law enforcement, unless of course you are a hypocrite. If there's lower crime in an area, it means less costly investigations, less need to hire cops on the beat, and lower costs in general. So yeah, private security has an economic incentive to lower the crime in an area, not just for the people who pay for it. Who's to say it will even be individuals or households that pay for private security? Businesses wanting to keep their assets secure, real estate developers wanting to attract home buyers. People might even be able to get crime insurance who will reimburse a victim the cost of the crime inflicted if the insurance company is unable to get the criminal to pay instead. I talked more about that on my court's problem video, so check that out when you get the chance. Long story short, these insurance companies will contract with private security to keep crime low, if only to mitigate their own financial risk. Any private police service that would only police wealthy and middle class areas without ever providing any law enforcement services to poorer areas would generate a huge amount more profit for their shareholders without compromising their ability to do their job. If this were true, then it wouldn't just apply to security. Imagine if, say, car manufacturers tried that. Any private dealer that only sells cars to wealthy and middle class buyers without ever providing any cars to poorer buyers would generate a huge amount of profit for their shareholders without compromising their ability to do their job. While brands like Ferrari and Mercedes-Benz do market to the rich, it's a niche market compared to auto giants like Toyota or Ford. You try proposing this business strategy to them, and you'll be laughed out of the boardroom, dumbass. And this is the big ANCAP argument, right? This is the, oh yeah, all the government things that the government does, private corporations could do better. There's also the big ANCAP argument about how everything the government does is fundamentally immoral, and it's paid for with stolen money. Kind of important. Are you gonna cut back on giving them proper equipment? Well, say goodbye to the vast majority of your workforce, because nobody's gonna work in a high-risk environment with no proper security gear and no proper gear to get the job done if instead they could also work a cushy job. Right, because the police will almost certainly need literal freaking tanks in order to do their job. For context, this individual is trying to guess which corners I would cut when budgeting for private security, which are so laughably ludicrous in the faultiness of the premise, I, I won't even entertain it with a reply. I only responded to this one because he accidentally comes to the defense of police militarization. Do you stop paying the oversight company that makes sure that you operate without corruption and properly to adequate community standards? Because the community you are policing that already cannot pay you will not also pick up the tab for the oversight organization. Obviously, they have no money to do this. If they can't do their job, they stop getting money. It's simple. 
And if you run the system like this, that's your 100% perfect recipe of having a completely unaccountable police force. If I wanted a completely unaccountable police force, I make their ability to get funding completely independent from the will of consumers. I give them a well of money as an uninterested third party with the mandate that they have to do whatever the hell I wanted. You know like what local governments do with giving government police stolen taxpayer money. Kinda important too. Oh, but my democracy. ESO's been showing this graph around, showing the likelihood of a law being passed is equally likely if its popularity is at 0% or 100%. Ergo, no. You have no say in a democracy, and even less say in how the police is run. A slave is no less a slave because they get to choose their master every four years. Will you maybe not invest as much into non-lethal and de-escalation techniques in order to protect your personnel and reduce the workload? Government police invest in non-lethal and de-escalation techniques? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I was not prepared for that level of naivete. Do you force the poor people to pay for your services even though they cannot pay for those services? It's called taxation. Are you at that point not the reason they cannot invest the capital they have gained through their own productivity and thus the reason they will remain poor? It's called taxation. Or will you offer them the opportunity to pay for your security services with their time and work by hiring them out to unskilled labor agencies, except you get the wages? You know, like slavery. Yeah, okay. Considering all the time he spends framing his prejudices about how a private security agency might operate in the form of questions, this is the pinnacle of bad faith argumentation, and at this point I have literally anything else better to do than to waste my time entertaining his idiocy. I already touched on how private police will work. You pay a crime insurance agency to reimburse you if you're the victim of a crime. Crime insurance agencies will hire security to mitigate their risk of payout to their clients. It's really simple. Obviously, having questions isn't a problem, but I don't believe this guy is looking for answers. He doesn't give a damn about whether or not civil defense is possible without government police. As far as he's concerned... His name. If anybody wants to fight or run, I'm a little trigger happy, guys. I'm not gonna lie. You know, I get paid a ton of money in overtime. If I have to shoot somebody, I don't do anything stupid. The subject of a viral video that gained national attention earlier this year for alleged police misconduct was sentenced today after being found guilty of resisting arrest. Now the police officer involved in the video is preparing to return to work next week. Edward Chi is live now with more from today's trial. All of these are just acceptable casualties. He is so afraid of being free that he will move the goalposts to find any excuse to avoid confronting the state and recognizing it for what it is. The very criminals he was asking them to protect us from. Questions? Comments? Critique? Is there any hope people like this might come around? Did I waste your time? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.